so here we are. Episode 8, the end of the season, and we're getting to the point where we have got the reduction in force, where some people will stay, some people will go. I guess it's kind of like a reality show in that case. But this is, we've got actually a lot to say in this episode technically. So let's take a look. Fulfilling the needs of the desk, I also stood out on my own. I formulated over two dozen bespoke macro trading strategies across a number of instruments, vanilla cash equities to exotic derivatives, leveraging at all points our different silos on the floor and cross-selling products at every opportunity. I can say confidently that by sales credits, I'm the standout grad in front of you today. And I want to prove that this track record of producing at the highest level isn't a one-time thing. I've carried the culture of the firm, led with integrity and thought like an owner. It's in my blood. I'm a pure point person. So here we see Harper walking down the street and she's listening to a recording of herself about what she's going to say in this riff presentation. And the first thing she's talking about are macro strategies. Macro strategies are used by portfolio managers where their mandate is focused around taking advantage or trading on big moves in the global economic area. And there will be big moves in things like interest rates and currencies. So macro means like macroeconomics, things which will affect whole economies or the whole global economy. Then she goes on to say, talk about vanilla cash equities. And what vanilla is, as I've explained before, it means it's a very plain product like vanilla ice cream. And cash equities are where people are buying equities directly for cash. But then they also, she's also throwing to the pot that she does exotic, de exotic derivatives as well. And usually you wouldn't do both. Usually you'd either do a kind of derivative or structured products, and then you'd have a separate team doing cash equities. So it's, it's unusual to see them both. Now she's on this cross products sales desk, which I haven't really seen very much in the city. I'm sure there are, um, there could well be um, but it's not something I've seen a lot. I guess it makes it more interesting if they do the mix. She's also talking about sales credits. We mentioned those before, where the sales team kind of get points and they add up the points at the end of the year and that will drive their compensation. Um, she also strangely says, well, there's silos on the trading floor, which means that as you normally have, you have different desks focusing on, diff focusing on different things. So you'd have a Govies desk fo focusing on, for example, um, the government bond trading, and then you would have a credit desk focusing on corporate bonds, you'd have cash equities focusing on just investing in stocks, etc. And there'd be many desks. Different firms will have different types of desks because different firms have different specialities or particular competitive advantage in one asset area. And then she goes on to say, despite the soling, siloing, that there are cross-selling opportunities. So it's a little bit of a kind of mixed message she's got there, but there are lots of technical things that we can talk about. I believe in liquidity is thin, trade fears with China, slower Chinese growth, big warnings in tech, and the usual Brexit sludge. Number 3% downside from last night's move before S&P circuit breakers kick in. <laughs> So here we have an announcement over the kind of public address system on the trading floor. And that's, I don't think that's terribly normal to have this kind of like tannoy announcer. Normally what you'd have is you have a trader shouting something out and it would be on Bloomberg um, or it would be a kind of TV show like uh, CNBC. Now what they're talking about a few terms which is interesting to talk about. The first is liquidity is thin. What that means is if liquidity is thin, it's often difficult to sell assets. There's not a, assets. There's not a lot of cash around that will be able to allow you to close the deal. And that often means that prices can be quite erratic. They can move upwards and downwards really quite suddenly. So liquidity is a being thin is a problem in the markets because it means that prices tend to be pretty erratic because there's not very much money around that will be interested in buying those assets. And that often happens in, in a kind of market crisis. Trade fears in China, an economic factor which is affecting the markets, that probably the, the big macroeconomic factors are very interesting to people who are trading on interest rates and also foreign exchange. So that will be something that they will be very interested in. The last thing they mentioned is about S&P circuit breakers. What a circuit breaker is, is a mechanism that if the market starts falling very, very fast, 
is that a, a circuit breaker kind of kicks in to stop trading and kind of give it just a bit of a pause so people can literally step back and have kind of a reality check. So the circuit breakers are there really to protect investors in a situation where the market is, is falling really dramatically. So we've had very good reports about you. Now here we've got Gus and Sarah in what is probably the executive dining room. The executive dining room um, certainly used to be on the, on the top floors of the building, particularly if it has a good view. And usually it would be used to take clients to. In the old days, and I remember going to Brussels at um, the JP Morgan office there, they had a, an ex executive dining room that if you were an officer of the bank, which is like a, a kind of official title, not like an analyst, associate vice president, or managing director, normally all associates will be officers. It means that you can sign official documentation and, and other things like that. Well, they had a separate dining room for officers of the bank and literally had white tablecloths um, they did take clients there, but if you were an officer, you could eat there at lunchtime. Now, those are the old days. I don't really think that happens now. But nevertheless, there still will, in most banks, be an executive dining floor or room where clients can go and the senior management team will sometimes go as well. So that's a pretty common thing. Now, in this situation, Sarah, who looks like she's a kind of chief operating officer or head of HR, is having an interview with Gus prior to this riff situation. Now, this is what we would call a cell interview. And you even get these in the very early stages of the application process, because if you apply to a firm and you get accepted and they really like you, there's probably going to be other competition from other firms who want to recruit you too. And in those situations, what will happen is you get invited, into the bank and often taken to the executive dining room and put through a sell interview where they'll sell the firm. So that is kind of what's going on here, except that Gus is already at the firm. But what in this case Sarah is trying to do is really kind of secure his continued tenure at the firm. I must be one of the only ones in my class that printed business this year. Everyone else is just glorified desk assistants. Then talk about that business. So in this situation, we've got Harper and Dara talking and they're talking about Harper's performance. And Harper's saying that she's the only one that printed business. Now, what that means is that she's the only one that she thinks actually executed trades for clients during that period. And printed business, really an old term. It's where when you confirm a trade, you have to write out this little document, which is a chit, and then you run along to the data enter enterers and they will type it into the system. So that's, I think, where the term printed business comes from. Good to see you, sir. How you doing? Yeah, great to see you again, man. How's Trust Fund Terry doing? Thanks, Trump. Hey there. Hey there. I don't want to sound Johnny paranoid, but that Adler gives me the fear. I he was having dinner with Boris last night, 5H. So there's a few bits of jargon in the program. There's one that I, I came across in an earlier episode where they're talking about HBS, um, which Daria had been to, and she um, describes it as kind of glorified networking opportunity. HBS stands for Harvard Business School, and she was talking about the fact that business school is a very expensive networking opportunity. And I think there's some truth to that, truth to be, truth be told. Now here, they're talking about 5H and 5H stands for 5 Hartford Street. And Hartford Street is a club and it's really focused on kind of um, the movers and shakers in the city and in um, high in, and in big industry. So that's what they mean by 5H, that's 5 Hartford Street. Some fucking anorak, crank the volume, please. Uh, Virio Partners and their new senior PM, Usman Aboud, aim to achieve long term capital growth through active management by bottom up stock picking. What's the most important thing you've learned about client relationships? 
So here we have the situation where they're doing the riff interviews. Now, as I said before, this is un really unrealistic. This does not happen. You don't have this kind of big interview that's recorded <laughs> and played at the whole training floor, but it makes great drama. So that's obviously why they're doing it. There's also uh, someone shouting out, can you get an anor anorak to fix the volume? An anorak would be a tech person. It's a very derogatory um, way of describing them. And that's what they're shouting out here. Now, much more interestingly, more importantly, we have got Rob talking about some of his clients, um, the portfolio managers, and he's talking about that a gr growth from um, performance in the active management. Now, there's a few terms here. Typically, investors, broadly speaking, are split into two major groups. Investors which focus on growth, investments, stocks that are going to grow very strongly, like well, in the past, Apple and Tesla, versus investors who will focus on value, where they basically looking for assets which they think are cheap, which we may not grow very fast, but will be cheap and therefore provide a kind of predictable, stable return. Now, in recent years, the growth investors have probably performed, outperformed the value investors. Value investors had a, a pretty hard time. But over the long term, value investors, generally speaking, have done better. And the most famous value investor is Warren Buffett. Now, the other thing that they're talking about is active management and passive management. Well, if you are a portfolio manager, typically you are an active manager. Passive investment tends to be through, as I mentioned earlier, the exchange traded funds, where you just have index funds, where you just buy a portfolio of securities which represent the index. There's no changes to that, and you just get the return on the index. And the senior PM just means senior portfolio manager, and they're talking about bottom-up stock picking. So bottom-up stock picking is where you actually start with the individual stocks first, and if he's a growth investor, he will focus on the stocks that he thinks will grow fastest. Top down is typically where you say, I think this overall sector is going to do well, or this particular geographical economy is going to do well. Once I've done that big asset allocation, then I will drill down and I will start to find individual stocks that I'll invest in. So you can either do bottom up or top down as your individual strategies. Never known Adler to fly in for graduate hiring. Hey, Yasmin, that's the global head of FIC. Fixed income. I know who he is. Now, here we have an interaction between Yasmin and Kenny on their desk. And they're talking about the American guy who walked into Rob's presentation. And you do sometimes find this, particularly the big American banks where big cheeses will come across the Atlantic and everybody starts to kind of go crazy. Um, because the big um, kahuna or big boss is here. And Kenny's saying that he's head of FIC. And FIC stands for Fixed Income Currencies and Commodities. So typically, a, an investment bank will be organized into the securities or sales and trading area and the investment banking division, which will include advisory and equity capital markets and debt capital markets. But within the global markets division, you will see further breakdowns. You will have the equities business that will include things like cash equities and equity derivatives and probably convertibles. And then you'll have the fixed income business, which will be the credit trading, corporate bonds, govies, which are government bond trading and the relative related derivatives. But then you'll also have currencies trading and commodities trading as well. And normally fixed income currencies and commodities get lumped together in this acronym, which is FIC, F-I-C-C. -C. Let me just say, first and foremost, without equivocation, after everything we've all been through, together, Allow me this indulgence. <clears throat> Buy the dip, short the VIX, fuck Bitcoin. Yes! <laughs> now, in this case, Gus is doing his presentation, and as we saw before Sarah had done the cell interview on him, 
So he probably feels he's in a very good position and he probably may have other offers, but it doesn't sound like it's that he wants to continue his career at Pierpoint. And it also sounds like the traders on the trading floor or his colleagues have at least have said, have kind of teed him up to say a few things and maybe they've got a bet that he wouldn't do it. But what does he say? He says, buy the dip. Obviously, if asset prices dip, you want to buy the dip because then you'll make money when they rise. But he's saying short the VIX. Now, what VIX is, is a, an index of volatility. And generally speaking, in financial markets, the thing that we measure risk by is volatility. So if we have more volatility, it means people are feeling that there's a lot more risk. And if there's a lot less volatility, it means there's a lot lower risk. Now, in some cases, people talk about the VIX being the fear index. So if the VIX is high, and volatility is high, that means there's a lot of fear in the markets. And typically in those situations, assets will be, asset values will be depressed and there will be a move towards safe assets. So in those situations, people would move to, towards say US treasuries because they're safe assets. So the prices of those assets would rise and the prices of riskier assets, e.g. junk bonds, would decrease. So the VIX is a, is a very important index of kind of fear in the market. So when the VIX goes up, there is more fear and general asset prices tend to depress more. So that's why they're saying short the VIX. So that means short volatility, which essentially means that you think there's going to be less volatility. And therefore, if there's less volatility because you've sold volatility, it means you can buy it back more cheaply, effectively. And then goes on to talk about F, Bitcoin. So it's a bit of a funny scene and it's pretty kind of unlike Gus to do this. If I know anything, it's that I have worked so that men can no longer make unilateral decisions in airless rooms. You know, Lehman was a dry goods store once. Really? Yeah. Management still used to call it the family business, which was bullshit. <laughs> On my desk, we used to call Dick Fuld, the CEO, the invisible man. He was never on the floor. An invisible man pushing people to sell invisible things. You know, over a thousand banks have failed in the last 10 years, about a dozen were created. We have answered too big to fail by making bigger banks. <laughs> now, this is an interesting discussion between Sarah and Harper. Sarah is the HR or COO person. So she's talking about her days at Lehman Brothers and Dick Fuld, who is the then CEO of Lehman Brothers. Now, Lehman Brothers famously failed in the financial crisis. And that was really the thing that triggered the major panic. And I'll tell you the reason why it triggered the major panic is that Lehman Brothers balance sheet was getting on or close to a trillion dollars worth of assets. And if that bank goes bust, what it means is that those trillion dollars of assets have to be liquidated to pay off the liabilities on the other side of the balance sheet. Now, imagine if you suddenly try and sell a trillion dollars worth of assets, that is going to just tank every price of asset in those categories. And so that's one of the problems of, of getting a bank and liquidating it is that there's just a massive amount of assets that you have to sell. And that will just really depress prices if you try and sell them in a fire sale. And that's really what this concept is of too big to fail, is that the institution is so large that it's almost impossible to kind of shut it down because you will just trash the markets. And if you look back into the pre-financial crisis, you had some banks like the Royal Bank of Scotland, which had a a balance sheet of over $2 trillion. So you can see how these banks were just too big to fail. Now, the regulators have come in and saying, look, if you are too big to fail, you need to have even more capital, even more of a headroom to protect your deposit holders. But that's what they're discussing here between Sarah and Harper. I'm really sorry. 
Daria speaking. Uh, okay, why? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll be right back. And then we are getting a drink, or six, to celebrate. We made it. <laughs> What's going on? I sat down with Adler. Why? And Eric. Eric, sorry, what's going on? Daria's gone and Eric's coming back. Now in this scene, you have got Harper and Yasmin talking and they're talking about Daria who's essentially been fired and in this case security coming and boxing up her stuff even without her there. I think that's pretty unusual. I think you'd normally have the person being fired actually doing the boxing up. Um, and generally speaking, I think you'd only involve security if they had been fired for misconduct or something like that and they'd be walked off the floor. Nevertheless, it makes great TV. Now, this is the end of the episode. So there's not many thing more to say technically, but the great news is we have got a second series, so we will see what goes on there. If you have any questions about stuff we haven't covered, put it in the chat window below and make sure you subscribe to our channel because we will be doing a lot more of these for different films and other things which will cover the financial markets. So good luck in any of your career choices and please let us know your questions.